Welcome back students. In this video segment we will take a look at three very very closely connected sections that have to do with first order differential equations. The first is section 3.4 uh, entitled linear differential equations and 3.5 is entitled more techniques for solving first order differential equations. We'll look at specifically two additional techniques and we'll round out the video segment by taking a look at a couple of very popular modeling problems, application problems that result in the, uh, in the types of differential equations that we see in 3.4 and 3.5. So let's go ahead and get started. The first section, section 3.4, uh, linear differential equations, has to do with or, or concerns itself with solving first order linear differential equations. First order linear differential equations are of the form q1 of x. So some function of x, y prime, plus some other function of x, q0 sub x, or q0 of x, y equals some function g of x. Okay. Uh, the q1 of x and q2 of q0 of x are coefficients of, of y and y prime. And very often they're constant, uh, but, and, but just as often they're, they're not. If g of x, and this is where you're going to start to see some similarities start to occur with our previous work in the course, believe it or not. If g of x is 0, then we get what's called a homogeneous differential equation. So the differential equation is homogeneous if the g of x, and very often that g of x is called a forcing function, and we, we borrow that from physics. If the forcing function g of x is 0, then we have a homogeneous first order linear differential equation. And it's, the similarity is with uh, systems of equations, homogeneous systems of equations versus uh, uh, specific types of homogeneous differential equations where the constant terms are zero. We call them homogeneous. And it's not a coincidence that we use the same term. It turns out that that uh, homogeneous differential equations satisfy many of the same properties as, as um, the homogeneous systems of, of uh, linear equations. Uh, specifically, the homogeneous system of linear equations was the null space, or is the null space of a matrix. It's uh, also true that we have a similar type of analogy with uh, homogeneous uh, linear differential equations. They, can, they are somehow a null space of some vector space. Okay, so that's all that all that is really. Uh, beyond us right now. Uh, right now we want to concentrate on solving methods of solution or a method of solution for solving linear differential equations. The first thing we're going to do along those lines is to divide both sides by q1 of x. So we're going to assume that, that q sub 1 of x is not zero, uh, at least in some interval along the x or on the x-axis, so an interval of x values, so we can form a differential equation defined on that interval. So let's divide both sides by q1 of x, in other words. If we do, we get a differential equation of the form y prime plus p of xy equals some function q of x. So technically the, the p of x is q sub 0 over q sub 1, and the q, uh, the q of x is g of x over q sub 1 of x. So we, we uh, divide both sides by q sub 1 of x, and this is our starting point. The idea, the idea is to be able to, to find some function, find some function, not the solution to the differential equation, but some function we can multiply the linear differential equation by to transform it into a differential equation we can simply integrate uh, both sides in which we can integrate both sides. So let me write that down because it's, it's kind of the, the whole idea with this, this business. So the idea, let me get a thicker pen here, the idea is this. The idea is uh, we want to multiply, or rather, sorry, we want to, we want to, let me slow down a little bit, to, let's say, be able to write 
uh, the left hand side the left hand side as the derivative with respect to x of some function which we're going to find u of x y okay i'd like to be able to take the left hand side this is the left hand side and multiply it by u of x u of x to to somehow make that left hand side into the derivative of some u of x times y and then i can integrate both integrate that to to solve for for y okay so then um, and then integrate oops let me uh change colors here and integrate and then integrate uh, with respect to x with respect oops let me see if I can clean that up a little bit with respect to x so if I do that if I do that the the de becomes the derivative with respect to x of u y equals uh, well if I'm multiplying both sides by u it'll equal u q and then integrate both sides with respect to x okay so so theoretically if I if I if I'm able to do this then I eliminate the differentiation process and I've got a solution Okay, so um, that u of x, that u of x is called an integrating factor, integrating factor. So let's, um, let's go ahead and do this. Let's take a look at uh, our differential equation y prime plus I'm leaving the of x off so y prime y prime plus p of x or just p y equals uh, q now imagine multiplying it both both sides of the differential equation by u and just so we can follow the u as being something we're introducing here I'm going to change colors here for the u so if I multiply both sides by u Bear with me here. And I'm going to get u, y prime, u, p of x, y, and u, q. Okay. Now, separately from that, separately from that, I want to look at what the derivative with respect to x of u, y would be. Uh, if I use the product rule and actually write this out. So let's use the product rule out. So note that the derivative of, of u times y is using the product rule again. It's, the, it's um, uy prime plus u prime y. So using the product rule, it's it's uh, the first times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first times the second. Now notice we have a matchup of some things. We have or one thing at least. We have u and u. I'm sorry, u y prime and u y prime matching up nicely. In order for this u to satisfy what we want it to satisfy. That is, so we can collapse the left-hand side of the differential equation into the derivative with respect to x of u times y. We're going to need, we're going to need that that u that we choose has to be equal to u times p. Okay. Now, if you're getting lost in all this, don't don't sweat it. This has a this, this uh, method has a really simple bottom line, but I'd like you to see how this, how this method came about. I'm not going to test you on deriving this method, so if you're not a math major, all you got to do is, is basically memorize the procedure. Okay, so the u, that the integrating factor that we multiply both sides by has to satisfy u prime equals u times p. That's just another differential equation, but that differential equation is separable. 
So let's solve it. Okay, this differential equation satisfying u is separable. This is this is the same thing as writing uh, du dx equals up. Separate the variables. You get du over u equals p dx. Then integrate both sides with respect to the variable on each side. That's the, the separation of variables technique here and guarantees us we can do that. And integrate. So we have the natural log of the absolute value of u equals, well, we don't know what the integral of p with respect to x is. P is, p is a coefficient of the, the y term in the differential equation. Okay, so that's as far as we can go with, with that. Uh, we'll add the constant of integration. Then let's solve for u. If we if we exponentiate, we get the absolute value of u equals e to the integral of p dx plus a constant, or e to the constant. We've seen this kind of things the thing happen before. Uh, absolute value of u, so u equals plus or minus e to the c e to the integral of p dx or u equals some constant k e to the integral of p dx. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to let k equal 1 to make this as simple as possible. Why, what justifies we can do that? Well, what justifies that we can do that is, remember, the whole idea is that we're multiplying both sides of the differential equation by this u. So imagine multiplying both sides by k e to the integral p dx and then simply dividing both sides by k to get rid of it. So we're going to let k equal 1, so we don't have to deal with it anymore, to get, and this is, this is the bottom line, the integrating factor is equal to e to the integral of p of x dx. Okay, so in, if we do that, then multiplying, multiplying both sides of y prime plus p of x y equals q by this u uh, gives us, gives us, the derivative with respect to x is guaranteed by the work we did above of uy equals uq. And then integrate both sides with respect to x. Then integrate. Then integrate to get the solution. So what I'd like to do is a few, a few exercises or a few examples to illustrate, mostly to illustrate how easy this method is. There, the last example is going to be a little tricky because of the integration, but the method goes the same no matter what. So let's let's solve, let's solve a, a differential equation and maybe a couple of initial value problems. So let's say solve a uh, y prime plus 1 over xy equals e to the x. By the way, these, these um, first order linear differential equations occur fairly, fairly early in physics. Um, if, you have, if you've had or you are taking now calculus-based physics, maybe, I can't remember if it, it's at Cerritos, it's 202 or 203, where you study um, uh, circuits. Uh, depending on your instructor, uh, when you when you use Kirchhoff's law to to set up uh, the equation involving the, the current, you end up using uh, or you end up getting for um, the, the the problem a first order differential equation, first order linear differential equation. Now again, it's going to depend on your instructor if they if they produce such examples, but, but it's fairly common in, in electromagnetism to see this happening really early in current, in, in the study of, of a current or um, circuit circuit analysis. Okay, so um, first thing, let's uh, let's find the integrating factor. I've I've restricted the differential equation to only exist for x greater than zero, so we can avoid absolute values. That you'll you'll see you'll understand that in a minute. So u equals the integral, the integrating factor equals the integral of 
1 over x with respect to x. It's the integral of p of x. p of x is the coefficient of, of the y term. Okay, and this gives us e to the ln. Well, the integral of 1 over x is the, is the natural log of x, absolute value of x. But since x is positive, we don't have to worry about the absolute values. Here, I did that on purpose. Okay, this could have been solved for x negative or unrestricted x, and it would be about the same. And notice there's no constant of integration with this integrating factor. We, we don't put the constant of integration in the integrating factor. We save that until the very end of the problem. Okay. So if I multiply both sides by u, I'm guaranteed that my left-hand side is going to look like the derivative with respect to x of u, y, of u, which is x, y. Okay, once again, this is the derivative with respect to x of u, y. And on the other side, I have u, q. So on the other side, I have u, q. Okay, so the, the, the difficulty in the problem is over. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that so quickly. Uh, the difficulty in at least setting up the, the last step to integrate is over. It, the problem could, could, be di could be very difficult depending on how hard it is to integrate the right-hand side. So I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to x, and that gives me xy equals the integral of x e to the x dx. So using integration by parts, I will get I would get e to the integral of x e to the x is x e to the x minus e to the x. If that's not ringing a bell, you ought to stop the video and look up integration by parts. Maybe your old homework, old textbook, even Wikipedia page to refresh your memory on integration by parts, which you're going to need to integrate by parts. Okay, for this problem. So there's there's the implicit solution. If I want an explicit solution, I divide both sides by x, or maybe say multiply both sides by x to the negative one. Absolutely equivalent. E to the x minus e to the x plus c. Okay, so there's there's our solution. Sorry about my border collie here. <laughs> what I get for having them down here while I'm um, recording. <laughs> Gotta love them. Okay, uh, let's look at another example. So example B, y prime plus xy equals x e to the x squared over 2. Let me clean that up. It doesn't look very x squared over 2-ish e to the x squared over 2. And this is a, an initial value problem. So we have y of 0 equals 1. OK, so um, let's, let's find the integrating factor. So let u be equal to e to the integral of p of x dx. And just to remind you, I'm doing that because this is first order linear. This is y prime plus p of, x y, p of xy equals q of x. So this is first order linear. That tells us that we find an integrating factor and then go forward. So the integral of x is x squared over 2. The antiderivative of x is x squared over 2 plus a constant, but we leave off the constant for the integrating factor. And then we multiply both sides by the integrating factor. Multiply both sides by u. If we do that, we get the derivative with respect to x of u e to the x squared over 2 times y equals u times q. So I'm going to need to multiply the function x e to the x squared over 2 by another e to the x squared over 2. So e to the x squared over 2 plus x another x squared over 2 is e to the x squared. Then I integrate both sides with respect to x. So uh, oops, uh, e to the x squared over 2 times y is going to equal the integral of e to the x squared with respect to x. 
the integral on the right hand side is very simple you if you want you could let u equal x squared then du equals 2x dx so I'll, I'll indicate that and I'll let you finish it if you if you're so inclined might be a good idea if you do that uh, you get one half e to the x squared plus a constant and then maybe multiply by e to the negative x squared over 2 to solve for y. So you have 1 half uh, e to the, well we have e to the x squared. We have e to the x squared times e to the negative x squared over 2 plus c e to the negative x squared over 2. Okay, so we have 1 half e to the single x squared plus c over 2 plus c e to the x squared over 2. Okay, now this is, uh, we're not out of the woods yet, this is an initial value problem. So y of 0 equals 1 implies that y is going to equal 1 when x equals 0. So that means that the constant of integration, or not the constant of integration, the constant for the differential equation is 1 half. And our solution then looks like 1 half uh, e to the x squared over 2 plus, well, c is 1 half, so e to the, ooh, 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 I think, we got a minus on c to the negative x squared over 2, the negative x squared over 2. And, okay, you engineers, do you recognize this function? This one is going to be important for you engineering types to recognize. This is the hyperbolic cosine of x squared over 2. Okay. All right, I'm going to take a look at one more example. This last example is a bit tricky. And we have to do a little bit of we have to do a little bit of thinking outside of the box here, so to speak. Uh, but it's a fairly common example. So look at our look at our last example. Our last example was y prime y prime plus xy equals x e to the x squared over 2. Now I want to, with y of 0 equals 1, I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to remove the x e to the x squared over 2. And that's going to create a problem that we'll get around. So y prime plus xy equals, well, before we had x e to the x squared over 2. Um, in fact, I'm going to remove uh, that whole thing and just make it 1. 1. Okay, with y of 0 equals 1. So that 1 is what we refer to as the forcing function. The, the function on the on the right hand side is very commonly called the forcing function. I think I mentioned that. Okay, it's still first order linear. It's still first order linear. So what I'm going to do, uh, why is it first order linear? Because it's y prime plus p of xy equals q. p is x, q is 1. Okay, so the integrating factor is e to the integral, same integrating factor as we had, as we had before. Fan just decided to fall down here. Okay, and this is equal to the same again. E to the as we had before, e to the x squared over two. So it looks it looks simple enough. Um, let's let's proceed. This integrating factor then changes the the uh, left hand side of the differential equation into the the derivative with respect to x of uy or e to the x squared over two times y equals e to the x squared over two. So we get by multiplying both sides, oops, x squared over 2, multiplying both sides by the integrating factor. Now here's the problem. The, if we integrate both sides, this is a problem. I'm going to identify it as a problem. Let's see if you can see the problem before I, I write it out. Do you see a problem with integrating both sides? e to the x squared over 2. The problem is that there, it's impossible to integrate the function e to the x squared over 2 
using finite combinations of elementary functions. Okay, in other words, for you it means we can't integrate. Even x squared over two is impossible to integrate for us. So let's say this is impossible. Impossible. This happens in engineering and in physics more generally often that our solutions to differential equations or other, whatever problems we're working on often end up with integrals that cannot be evaluated explicitly. So here's a trick. Here's our trick. It's an extremely common trick to use and it's not difficult. It's just something new for you, like most of this course. <laughs> Okay, the problem, the solution is to do this. We're going to, I mean, I'm going to copy our differential equation. Let's see if it's quicker for me to just cut and paste it. To rewrite it, probably just to rewrite it would have been better, whatever. Okay, here's our, here's where we're, we're stuck at the moment. Okay, the, uh, the thing we want to do, let me move it over. The thing we want to do, and I, I, this trick is just so neat, is replace the variable x with a new variable. The variable x can be replaced with any variable, and you're not changing. The only thing you're changing is the, the variable in which the solution is written in terms of. You can always go back to x. So the trick is to change variables. So the trick is to first change to new variable, new independent variable, independent variable, D, variable. So I'm going to do that, variable. I'm going to use T. So instead of derivative with respect to x, it's going to be the derivative with respect to t. Instead of e to the x squared over 2, it's e to the t squared over 2. Instead of y of x, uh, it's y of t. Instead of e to the x squared over 2, it's e to the t squared over 2. Nothing is changed. A variable is just a placeholder for a number. Okay, so you can replace t with x, q, z, anything you want. Just realize that your solution is going to be in terms of that new variable if you were to proceed. Now, further, the, the trick involves integrate both sides with respect to t. Okay, so I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to t, but there's a little bit more to this trick. I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to t from 0 to x. From 0, oops, I forgot the equal sign, didn't I? To x. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to integrate the left-hand side. Left-hand side is a function of t, so I can integrate it with respect to t. And I can integrate it as a definite integral. So I'm going to do that. From, from where? From 0 to x. There's, there's nothing that needs justification here. There's no, no fancy thing going on. I'm just integrating both sides of a function of t from 0 to x. Okay, But the the, the beauty of this shows up in a bit. This is one of many, many tricks in mathematical physics that will allow uh, engineering and physics to have uh, nice solutions. Okay, so let's con continue. Well, what happens with the integral with respect to t and the derivative with respect to t? What do they do to each other? They cancel. A mental theorem of calculus kind of allows that to happen. So they cancel and they leave the function. They leave e to the t squared over 2 y of t evaluated from 0 to x. On the right hand side we're stuck with that just the way it is. On the right hand side we are stuck with the integral from 0 to x of e to the t squared over 2 dt. Back to the left-hand side. Substitute upper and lower limits of integration. So you have e to the x squared over 2 times y of x. y of x, remember, that's our solution. Minus e to the 0 squared over 2. e to the 0 is 1, so minus y of 0 equals 
the integral from 0 to x e to the t squared over 2 dt. Now why did I choose to integrate from 0 to x instead of from 5 to x? Well look at what we have in our in our final line so far, final solution so far. We have y of 0 and this is an initial value problem where, where we were given y of 0. That's why I chose to integrate between 0 and x. I integrated from 0 because I'm given y of 0. I integrated to x because our solution <laughs> needs to be in terms of the, the x variable. And y of 0 is 1. I can't remember. Yeah, 1. Okay. So let's do that and, and finish up this solution. So e to the x squared over 2 times y of x minus 1 equals the integral from 0 to x of e to the t squared over 2 dt. That right-hand side has that integral where, where, that we're prohibited from integrating. We cannot integrate e to the any constant times t squared or x squared. Okay. Uh, why? Well, most of you aren't math majors, so <laughs> because <laughs> because mathematicians have proven it. So if you're a math major, you're going to see why. And it's, but it's going to take um, more math to do that. Okay. okay. All right. I added one to both sides, and I multiply both sides by e to the negative x squared over two to get our solution. If I multiply e, e, both sides by e to the negative x squared over 2, I get uh, y equals e to the negative x squared over 2 plus e to the negative x squared over 2 times the integral from 0 to x e to the t squared over 2 dt. That is the best we can do for a solution. What's wrong with it? Nothing. It's an exact solution. If you needed to compute y values, you would probably need to use uh, integral approximation techniques. Um, Simpson's rule, trapezoid rule, midpoint rule, whatever, or, or modified versions of those things that are more accurate uh, to find explicit y values. Many, if not most, of the functions that you deal with and, and uh, that are close to real life examples are going to have strange solutions. They're going to have strange solutions, okay? All right, so let's move on to section 3.5. Okay, so our next section, section 3.5, more techniques of solving or for solving first order differential equations. Specifically from this section, we're only going to look at two uh, additional methods, two very popular methods for solving first order, some first order differential equations. Not every first order differential equation is going to be separable or exact. We have saw we saw that in previous uh, sections. Nor is every first order differential equation going to be linear, first order linear. Okay, so sometimes we have first order, first order differential equations that require additional methods. Sometimes we can't use any of these methods, but uh, so well, the idea is to present you with uh, techniques that are that are used to solve several or or a few popular types of first order differential equations that occur in STEM field math courses. Okay, so back to given something we've seen before that given the differential equation in the form m of x y dx plus n of x y dy equals zero. And let's assume that, it, that the equation is not exact and not separable and not first order linear. The idea, the idea is maybe the differential equation is of a, of a specific type. The idea, if possible, and again, it's not always going to be possible, is to transform the differential equation, m dx plus n dy equals zero, into the form dy dx equals some function of x over y. dy dx equals some function of x over y. And then make the substitution of u equals that. I think I said x over y, f of y over x. And make the substitution u equals the y over x. And if the differential equation is set or if it satisfies a certain property then that result will be separable now now don't go too far with what i just said this won't always work if our differential equation can be written in the form uh, dy dx equals f of y over x 
we may be able to make the substitution u equals y over x if the dif and tra to transform the differential equation into a separable one if something is true about the coefficients m and n. Okay, so let's go back to our differential equation. This differential equation, this differential equation is said to have homogeneous coefficients. Is, we're using this, that word again. Is said to have homogeneous coefficients coefficients if now we're again we're using the word homogeneous here but for a very different thing okay than we've seen it before but the the the, the differential equation is said to have homogeneous coefficients if m of constant a times x constant a times y over n of ax a y equals the original m of x y over n of x y. Okay, so I know it's kind of kind of a bizarre thing, um, and I, your author does. I think your author does a proof of of, of uh, why this this works. Uh, but again, we're we're uh, we're not a course for math majors here. We're a course. This is a course for science majors, specifically engineering majors, so so your primary interest, most of you, is just going to be in procedure. So if if um, if the DE has homogeneous coefficients, homogeneous coefficients, then the substitution the substitution, the substitution, substitution, u, oops, I keep doing that, u equals y over x transforms the differential equation into being separable. Separable. Then we separate the variables and, and use that and, and solve as we did before. So let's um let's see how this works. Let's see how this works. For example, solve four uh, x plus y dx plus four y minus x dy equals zero. This is not, this equation is not exact. If you take the, the partial of, of m with respect to x, you get 4. Oops, there it really goes again. Hold on a second, got to get him to quiet. It's my, again, that's my evil border collie, Thomas, and he barks. He hangs out by the front door and barks at skateboarders going by. That's his, that's his job for uh, 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, this, uh, this equation is not exact. If you take m as 4x plus y and n is 4y minus x, the partial of m with respect to y is 1. I think I said it wrong a few seconds ago. Partial n with respect to x is negative 1, so not exact. Not exact. Okay. Definitely not separable. So let's test to see if the function is uh, has uh, the, I'm sorry the differential equation has homogeneous coefficients so let's do it this way homogeneous coefficients question mark I don't know let's find out so let's find m of a x comma a y and divide by n of a x comma a y. So m of a x is for a x plus a y plus a y over n of a x a y is for a y 
minus ax. And you can definitely factor out the a and cancel out the a's. Okay, so this is just 4x plus y over 4y minus x, and that is the original m of x, y over n of x, y. So, yes. So, yes. Homogeneous coefficients. Homogeneous coefficients. The idea, though, is that once it's ho the the homogeneous, we have homogeneous coefficients, is that we can transform the differential equation into being a function of y over x. And I'll show you how to do that. It's very simple. Then make a, a substitution of u equals y over x to make the differential equation separable. Okay. You missed that. Um, to transform form, uh, DE into uh, DY DX equals some function of Y over X. Okay. Now the fact that it has homogeneous coefficients guarantees that we can do that. <laughs> um, so if you missed that, don't worry about it. It's just, just do it. Let's find dy dx first. So the original, the original differential equation was given in differential form. So if we write this differential equation in a derivative form, we get dy dx equals 4x plus y over x minus 4y, I believe. Yeah, just make sure. Yes, okay. Um, let's try to make the right-hand side uh, into a function of y over x. So I'm gonna divide numerator and denominator by x. Divide numerator by x. Divide the denominator by x, and then look at that. The right-hand side is a function of y over x. I can remove the y over x's and put u in their place, and that's thir the third step. Third step is let u equal y over x. This will transform, um, given my statement above, of what it's supposed to do. It'll transform the differential equation into separable. Let's do that. Well, if u equals y over x, that means y equals xu. And that means dy dx by the product rule. Product rule equals derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second is du dx. So there's dy dx. So let's make the transformation. So dy dx is u plus x times du dx on the left hand side. On the right hand side we get 4 plus u over 1 minus 4u. And the theory tells us, the theory behind the scenes, it tells us that this differential equation is separable. It doesn't look separable yet, but we're guaranteed that if we've done everything right algebraically that this is going to be separable. So let's let's do this with that in mind. Let's uh, Let's uh, try to separate variables. Let's subtract u from both sides. So we have 4 plus u over 1 minus 4. Looks like I have a w there for some reason. Or u. Minus u. Minus u from the right-hand side. So minus u over 1. And then I'm going to multiply that u over 1 by 1 minus 4u over 1 minus 4u. So I combine to algebraically have just one fraction. So I'm going to get u plus 4, or 4 plus u, minus u plus 4u squared, if I did that right, I'm pretty sure I did, over 1 minus 4u. Again, my u looks like another w. 
Okay, so it looks like a W, but whatever. <laughs> let's keep uh, let's keep going with this. So this is x times du dx equals uh, the u's cancel on the numerator. Four times one plus u squared. Look at this; it is completely separable. And separate the separate the um, variables. Okay, so if I multiply both sides by the reciprocal of the right hand side and also multiply both sides by dx over x, I get 1 minus 4u over, uh, let's say, 4 times u squared plus 1, or 1 plus u squared, doesn't matter, equals dx over x. I separated the variables, and now integrate. Now, integrate. Integrate. So how do we integrate that on the left? Well, you could do partial fractions. Well, not really, actually. <laughs> so was, first I was going to say do partial fractions but I, on the left, but I don't think that, that's going to do very well. It's already in partial fractions form. U squared plus 1 is uh, doesn't factor outside of a set of real numbers. So actually, it's outside of, doesn't, yeah, if you use complex, you, u minus i times u plus i. Anyways, um, I forgot the differential on that. So I can separate the, the left-hand side into 1 fourth times the integral times 1 over u squared plus 1. The integral of that with respect to u minus the other part, 4u over u squared plus 1, which will give us u over u squared plus 1. Always stop the video and check this out if, you, if you're not sure about what I did. It equals the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a constant. The first integral is the inverse tangent, common integral. If you don't remember that, look it up. <laughs> you gotta, you got to be able to integrate uh, the common integrals from Calc 2. Uh, if you make you can make another substitution of v equals u squared plus one, so you get a logarithm out of that. Again, you can stop the video and do that if you need. U squared plus one equals the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a constant. Finally, substitute y over x back in. Can't can't leave the solution like this. We can't leave the solution in terms of a variable we never had to begin with. So u is y over x minus one half natural log of y over x squared plus one equals the natural log of the absolute value of x plus a constant. Look at that wild solution. That is a wild looking solution. There's no way we're gonna get a an explicit solution out of that. Okay. The method is not too hard. If you have um, if you have a first order differential equation that has uh, of the form m dx plus m dy with homogeneous coefficients, transform it into being separable by making the subs the substitution u equals y over x. Okay, uh, we're going to finish this section with one more very popular type of differential equation. So here it is. This is our last type of differential equation. I haven't written the whole thing out yet. I wanted to save that for a second. It's called a Bernoulli differential equation. Bernoulli. Uh, I assume that, I think his name is Joseph Bernoulli. I think. I, I assume that this guy published some stuff on it, on this differential equation, and probably got his name attached to it for forever for doing so. So more power to him. Um, I haven't got my name attached to any solution, so I haven't seen any Leon differential equations. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I can deal with that. Anyways, the Bernoulli differential equation starts out similar to the one we've seen today, or in this video segment. This video segment? Yeah. This is the last one. It was the last video segment. Uh, first order linear, first order linear differential equations. The left-hand side looks like y prime plus p of xy. But the, the linear first order differential equation has q of x on the other side 
but the Bernoulli differential equation is going to have q of x times some power of and of the of the uh, dependent variable of the solution y to the n. This is not a linear differential equation. A first order linear differential equation never has a power of the solution in it otherwise other than the first power in, in the p of x y uh, term. So the idea, the idea, idea is also is very simple. The idea is to make a transformation. Make a transformation that will transform the differential equation into a first order linear differential equation. Make a transformation. And I'll show you what that transformation is. Transformation. Uh, to transform form the differential equation into first order linear and then use that technique to the technique we developed to to uh, solve it okay that, that is, there goes the border collie maybe I should offer extra credit for people to accurately count up how many barks my border collie gives in this, in this section anyways <laughs> <laughs> Onward. Make a transformation to, to transform the differential equation to first order linear. Okay, so let me show you how that works. It's not hard. In fact, um, I personally, rather than memorize the substitution, I just, I work the, the idea. I do it, to, I just, I uh, perform the operations to transform the differential equation into first order linear for each differential equation without worrying about what the the solution or the substitution would be. If you don't, if you didn't follow what I said, I, I don't blame you. Here's here's our differential equation. So, what's the problem now that's keeping this from being first order linear? The problem is the y to the n. Yeah, that's the problem. So let's get rid of the problem. Let's multiply both sides by y to the negative n. Okay, so get rid of the problem. That's the first step. We don't get we don't get a solution that quickly by by uh, getting rid of the problem, but it's, it puts us on our way. So if I multiply both sides by y to the negative n, I get y to the negative n y prime plus p times y to the one minus n. I already had y to the first on the left hand side, right? Multiply by y to the negative n. I have an additional minus n in the exponent and equals q. So now what's keeping this from being first order linear? Now we have a new problem. This is the new problem. We have a new problem. First order linear needs to have p of x y, not y to the 1 minus n. So make a substitution of a new variable equaling that old variable y to the 1 minus n, or that old variable expression. If you missed it, just stay tuned and watch. Let me get rid of the new problem and then make the substitution. Substitution V equals Y to the 1 minus N. Okay. I'm going to show you how this works in the general case. It looks kind of messy, but in, in working at each uh, specific problem, it's not so messy at all. So if v equals y to the 1 minus n, then dv uh, dx, differentiating, equals 1 minus n comes down, decrease the power by 1, multiply by derivative of the inside function by the chain rule. Okay, And let's solve for y to the minus n dy dx. So I'm dividing basically both sides by 1 over, or rather dividing both sides by 1 minus n dv dx. So make the substitution. Okay. Let me move my differential equation down if, if I can do that. Or I guess I just rewrite it y to the minus n. Here's, here's, here's my differential equation from, from above. 1 minus n equals q. So y to the minus n y prime 
is 1 over 1 minus n dv dx uh, plus p times the substitution 1 to the 1 minus n is v equals q. That's first order linear. Doesn't look like it with that 1 over 1 minus n. If I multiply both sides by 1 minus n, I get dv dx plus 1 minus n p of x v equals 1 minus n q of x. That's first order linear. This is of the form y prime, but except it's v prime, plus p of x y equals q of x. Okay, so let's say p1 y q1. It's linear, first order linear. First order linear. And we look for an integrating factor and proceed. So let's uh, let's look at one example. It, you'll see that it's really it's really not that difficult of a, a method to use. None of these methods really are. The, the difficulty is in the integration that we have to do if if there is going to be any different difficulty. So suppose we want to solve y prime minus x to the negative one y equals four x squared. Uh, y to the negative 1, there goes the linear, it's no longer linear, uh, times cosine x. Let's say for x greater than 0, just to avoid absolute values and stuff. Okay, this is a Bernoulli differential equation. It starts out linear, looking on the left. y prime plus p of xy. p of x is negative x to the negative 1. Equals q of x, but then there's an extra power. There's an extra power, so this is definitely in the form y prime plus p y equals q y to the n, where the y to the n is y to the negative one. So it's Bernoulli. It is Bernoulli. Once we've determined that it's a Bernoulli differential equation. Then you, I would just use, I wouldn't memorize the substitution, I would use the procedure, transform it into first order linear. Get rid of that y to the negative 1, multiply both sides by y. I multiply both sides by y to the positive 1, I get y y prime plus p y squared equals that nice 4 x squared cosine x, no longer have, has a power of y, but it's not linear because on the left hand side it needs to be py, py. So this tells you make the substitution, let v equal y squared. So dv dx equals 2y, y prime, 2y dy dx. So y, y prime, y dy dx equals 1 half dv dx. Then make the substitution. y y prime is 1 half dv dx plus, uh, oh wow, uh, I, I have p of x in our differential equation. You probably noticed it. So I'm going up to the differential equation and here, here's our different, oops, let's do this. Going up to our differential equation. And I have still p in there, so I want, I want to get that p out of there. It's minus x to the minus 1. Sorry about that, you guys. So It's no big deal, but it's probably irritated you to see that. So minus x to the minus 1. Okay, so if you need... Uh, I multiplied both sides of my dif original differential equation by y, giving me y, y prime, and that's the red arrow now, uh, minus x to the minus 1, not plus p, because we have a specific p, uh, y squared equals q. Okay, then we make the substitution, v equals y squared, and everything's okay from then. So y, y prime is 1 half dv dx minus, let's get rid of this, 
minus x to the minus 1 v was a substitution equals of the same old for x squared cosine x. Okay, so I think everything's good now. So let's uh, let's solve this. This is now first order linear. This is now first order linear, which says go ahead and use the integrating factor and stuff. Well, first order linear, we need dv dx by itself. So we're going to multiply both sides by 2. So let's do that. Equals... Um, 8 x squared cosine x. So the integrating factor, integrating factor, just to remind you, that's the u and it's equal to e to the integral of the p, the coefficient of v in this case or e to the minus 2 log of x, no absolutes necessary since we're looking at x greater than 0, or e to the ln x to the minus 2, or simply x to the minus 2. So that's our integrating factor. The integrating factor transforms the left hand side into d dx of the single x to the minus 2 v, multiplying both sides by the integrating factor, and, and the first order linear theory or whatever transforms our differential equation into a derivative on the left hand side equals, on the right hand side I'm just going to get 8 cosine, because I have to multiply it by x to the negative 2, then simply integrate both sides with respect to x equals the integral of 8 cosine x with respect to x or x to the negative 2 times v equals integral of cosine is sine, so 8 sine x plus a constant. Uh, then let's get rid of that v. Remember, v was y squared, I believe. Yeah, v is y squared. So let's write the solution in terms of y, x and y. So x to the minus 2 y squared equals 8 times the sine of x plus a constant. Okay. And that would be fine. You could also imagine some textbooks are going to want positive exponents, but it really doesn't matter. This is the, the solution I have is just fine, or you can multiply, say, by x squared on both sides. Uh, let's say, yeah, eight, uh, x squared times 8 sine x plus c. But this, this is the, this line above is just fine. There's nothing wrong with oops, find. Find is this line right there. Okay. Uh, that takes care of the, the two techniques, the additional techniques that I, that I wanted to look at. I want to finish up this video segment by looking at some application problems. The reason why you're taking this course most likely is that you're a science major and you're you're desire is not to solve differential equations, but to use them as tools to sign, solve application problems. We're going to look at some two really, really popular uh, application problems in our, in our next uh, section, section 3.6. Let's do that. And I'm going to take a break for about five minutes, which will appear to be like five seconds, because I'm going to stop the video, and we'll pick up. Okay, so let's Let's finish our video segment again by looking at using some of the stuff we learned to do some some uh, experiments or some some physical uh, problems. Okay, the, the um, we're going to look at two. The uh, the first is called a mixture problem. A mixture problem, and in, later in the course, oh, probably in about a month or so, we're gonna we're gonna uh, look at a at generalizing this mixture problem a little bit, but for the time being we'll keep it real simple. We have a container, a container, a bathtub or a sink or, or a bucket with a hole in it if you want, and what's going on in, in this situation is that we have, in this container, we have an initial amount of liquid present. 
component that that's really the ugliest thing I've drawn today here. Here's the level of the liquid initially. We initially have uh, a certain amount of, of uh, liquid in this tank. Okay, so let's say V for volume of zero equals the, the volume uh, of a liquid in the tank at T equals zero. Okay, initial volume. Okay, not velocity, but volume. Okay, and in this liquid, in this liquid, there's a certain amount of uh, substance dissolved in the liquid. Okay, let's say S is the amount of substance that's dissolved in the tank at t equals zero. So this is the amount of, and you can think about it as, let's say, the amount of salt that's dissolved in this, in water. Okay, the amount of substance, very commonly salt is used as a description, or sugar or whatever. The amount of substance in the tank at time uh, t equals zero. Okay, so the volume would be in let's say liters or um, gallons. Okay. You could use other units, but liters or gallons, for example. And the amount of substance in the tank would be, say, kilograms or grams, kilograms or grams or whatever, whatever uh, units you'd like. Or let's say pounds in the British system. Pounds of substance in the tank at time equals zero. Okay. So, at time equals zero, this, these are the initial, these are the initial conditions, we'll call them, for our uh, mixture problem. Then, what happens is, uh, instantaneously, is we start pouring some additional liquid into the tank, and at the same time, allow liquid stirred the stirred mixture. We, we we allow new liquid in, stir it up, and let it leave the tank. At possibly a different rate that we're we're letting liquid enter the tank. So let's say we let uh, liquid into the tank at a rate r1. So this is the rate at which liquid enters the tank. Okay, and let's say that the liquid that's entering has a specific concentration of that substance. C1 is the concentration uh, of the substance, salt, sugar, whatever, substance entering tank. So the rate at which liquid enters the tank will be in say uh, liters per minute or gallons per minute, etc. The concentration of substance will be in Gram, kilograms or grams, whatever, per per what? The concentration in the liquid per liter or pounds per gallon, etc. Those are the units of concentration. Other units are possible, but it's always mass per volume the con as a concentration. Okay, so what's going to happen then? 
simultaneously again is that liquid will be allowed to enter to leave the tank let's say at r2 so this is the rate at which liquid uh, leaves tank leaves tank so if if uh, liquid is leaving the tank uh, s more slowly than liquid is entering the tank then then the volume of the of the tank is going to increase so if the rate in is more than the rate out then the the uh, tank will overflow eventually it's like a bathtub if you turn if you turn the water on if you turn the water on and the and it and the water goes in comes or the faucet has the rate coming in at three gallons per minute and you at the same time you open the plug to the uh, tub and it leaves at two uh, per minute then the the tank the the tub bathtub will overflow okay So just like the the rate in, the rate out will be in liters per minute or gallons per minute or gallons per hour or or volume per per time. Uh, sorry, yeah, volume per time. Whoops. <laughs> the concentration leaving is not as simple as a ma of a matter. The concentration of the uh, substance leaving is a little more complicated you see the um, I'm having a hard time writing with this thing oh, here it is the amount of substance that's in the tank at time t is not constant because we have an initial concentration in the tank before we start pouring liquid in but as soon as we start pouring liquid in the uh, concentration in the in the tank is uh, changes immediately okay so the concentration leaving will be the amount of substance in the tank at time t now remember the amount of substance you can think about is uh, let's say um, uh, kilograms or I think we're using that kilograms whatever let me do my red ink for that kilograms uh, and the volume is not constant so over the volume the amount of, of liquid in the tank and that will be in say liters so the volume and the subs the amount of substance in the tank at time t is varying is varying because the the, the 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 concentration entering the the tank may not equal the concentration you know, of substance that's initially in the tank okay so this is a little more complicated okay so what we're going to do is we're going to set up uh, what's called a system of differential equations this is very making it sound much more complicated than it is we have two differential equations that are satisfied one is going to be satisfied by the the s of t s of t is the amount of of substance in the tank substance in tank at time t and another differential equation is going to be satisfied by the volume of the of the liquid in the tank so v of t is the volume of liquid in tank, uh, tank at time t. Okay, so let's uh, let's set up a, a differential equation for v first, volume. The rate of change of volume in the tank, dv dt, is going to be what? Well. Uh, think about the bathtub example if if water is entering at three gallons per minute and leaving uh, through the drain at two gallons per minute 
So we'll have a net rate of increase of one gallon per minute in volume of the per, uh, uh, one gallon one gallon per minute in the tank. The net rate of change of volume will be one. So the um, the differential equation for the volume will be dv dt equals the rate in minus the rate at which liquid is leaving the tank. So R1 minus R2. Okay, And it's not just a differential equation though, it's an initial value problem because we have an initial volume in the tank. V of 0 equals, let's say, V sub 0. Okay. A little more complicated is a differential equation that's satisfied by the amount of substance, the, 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 num, the, the pounds of salt or kilograms of salt in the tank, t, the tank at time t. Okay, the, the idea is the same though. The, the rate of change of the amount of substances in the tank is going to be the rate at which substance enters minus the rate at which substance leaves. So the substance, the concentration entering would be, say, C1. This is the concentration of, of the substance entering. And you can think about that as being, uh, let's say, kilograms per liter. And if we multiply that by the rate at which uh, liquid enters the tank, we'll be in liters per minute, then a dimensional analysis will tell us that this gives us the kilograms, not the number of kilograms entering per minute, or the amount of substance, the rate at which the substance enters the tank. Okay, In simple terms, uh, liters cancel and we get kilograms per minute. Okay, So there's the rate at which the substance enters the tank. So the rate at which substance leaves the tank is very similar. It's the concentration leaving times the rate at which liquid leaves. However, however, the concentration leaving is a little more complicated. The concentration leaving is the amount of substance in the tank at time t divided by the specific volume in the tank at time t. Okay, so in general we will have for these mixture problems, of course with S of 0 equaling, let's say, S of 0. In general for these mixture problems we're going to have uh, two differential equations to solve. We have one involving volume, which is a, a very simple differential equation, and we have one involving the amount of actual substance in the tank at time t. And that will uh, that will be a little more complicated to to to, to solve, but not not too bad. Your, your author gives this this general case. Um, arguably, the the problems could be solved just by looking at by arguing your way through the the problems individually without looking at, looking at the the general case. So. Um, your, your author, the author of your textbook just does that. He, he solves a problem and then just uh, reasons his way through that one problem hoping that the students will get the, the general idea. So if that's okay with you, you don't have to use this general case, but um, I, I thought it would be a good idea to present it. So let's solve, let's solve a problem. Okay. So here's our problem. A tank contains eight liters of water in which 32 grams of salt is dissolved. Those are our initial conditions. We have eight, eight liters in there and 32 grams of salt are dissolved into this eight liters of water. A solution then containing two grams per liter, that's a concentration, of salt flows into the tank at four liters per minute. And the well-stirred mixture, so this mixture is being shaken and stirred up constantly, the, the well-stirred mixture flows out of the tank at 2 liters per minute. So I want to determine a couple of things. First, how much salt is in the tank after 20 minutes? 20 minutes. And then determine the concentration of the salt at that specific time. Okay, so let's tear this problem apart bit by bit. Okay. 
Okay, so what's going on here? We have initially, we have initially eight liters of water. So the, let's say V of zero will be eight liters. And uh, 32 grams of salt are dissolved initially into this mixture. So 32 grams of salt are dissolved. So eight liters, 32 grams of salt. Okay. A solution then containing two grams per liter flows into the tank. So into the tank is a concentration of two grams per liter. At a rate, though, R1, of four liters per minute. Okay. Simultaneously, the well-stirred mixture flows out of the tank at two liters per minute. Okay, so I didn't. I think I didn't write in uh, four liters per minute. I'm coming out at two liters per minute. Okay. So, from this information, we're supposed to come up with the amount of salt in the tank. Uh, the salt in the tank. The amount of salt in the tank and the concentration of salt in a tank both after 20 minutes of time. So we need the amount of salt in the tank at time t. We need s of t. So let's set up the differential equations that are supposed to be satisfied by the two quantities v and s. So first of all, uh, v. The rate of change of volume dv dt is the rate at which liquid enters for minus the rate at which liquid leaves, 2. Okay, so dv dt equals 2 with the initial volume in the tank as 8 liters of uh, water, of, of uh, liquid. Okay, well this differential equation is very simple. dv dt equals 2 uh, with the initial condition, so the initial value problem uh, involving volume is very simple. Just integrate it. In, just integrate both sides with respect to t. So v equals 2t, say, plus c. v of 0 equals 8. So when t equals 0, I get uh, 8 equals 0 plus c, or c equals 8. That tells me my volume needs to be 2t plus 8. Okay, well, we're going to need that in a minute. Now, the differential equation involving the, the amount of salt in the tank is still satisfied by computing the rate at which salt leaves, enters rather, minus the rate at which salt leaves. Well, salt is entering at 2 grams per liter at a rate of 4 liters per minute. And exiting is, exiting is, well, what's the concentration C2, the concentration leaving? The concentration is the amount of salt in the tank, which is variable now, divided by the volume of, of uh, the tank, which is also variable. So uh, the concentration leaving is S of T gallons per V of T liters times the rate at which li liquid is leaving at two liters per minute. Okay, so let's get rid of all the units. So this is eight minus uh, S but we know volume. We know the volume is 2t plus 8. So s of t over 2t plus 8 times 2 liters per minute. Okay, and that's the differential equation satisfied by s along with the initial condition gives us an initial value problem. The initial amount of salt in the tank was 32 grams. Okay. 
So now the next question is, how do we solve D, uh, the, the um, differential equation involving S? Well, if we rewrite it as ds dt plus 2 over 2t plus 8s equals 8, we can see that this is first order linear. This is sort of like y prime plus py equals q. But of course, we don't have y. We have s, and, and uh, our variable is t instead of x. So it's first order linear. First order linear. First order linear. Okay. Well, let's um let's simplify this first. Notice the coefficient of s can be simplified. I can factor a 2 from 2t two plus 8 and then cancel that. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to factor the 2 and out of the denominator and cancel it. So we have 1 over t plus 4s equals 8. And then we find an integrating factor. So u equals e to the integral of the coefficient of y, but we don't have a y. We have s. And our functions are with respect to time. So this is e to the natural log of t plus 4. No absolute value is necessary here as long as we assume that t is greater than 0. And we remember if we leave out the constant of integration for the integrating factor. So we have t plus 4. T plus 4. So this integrating factor guarantees that the left-hand side of my differential equation looks like the, the single derivative of my integrating factor times the variable was uy before, so now it's t plus 4 times s, since our variables are t and s, equals multiplying both sides by t plus 4, I get 8 times t plus 4. Okay, so now integrate both sides with respect to t equals the integral of 8 times t plus 4 dt. Now I could integrate t plus 4 as t squared over 2 plus 4t, or I can think about it as making a u substitution of t minus 4 or t plus 4. Then this would become, I'm going to move this down a little bit. eight times t plus four squared over two plus some constant. I think I use c above, so I'm gonna put c one. Okay. So that says that s, the amount of substance, if I divide both sides by t plus four, equals four times t plus four, because 2 divides into 8 4 times, I'm dividing by t plus 4, plus um, c1 over t plus 4. Okay. Alright, so I'm just making sure I didn't make any mistakes with this. I think it's okay. <laughs> And now we have an initial condition. Initial condition is that s of 0 was 32. So 32 equals 4 times when t equals 0, I get 4 plus c1 over 4. So I get 16 equals c1 over 4. So c1 equals 64. So the amount of salt in the tank at time t then is 4 times t plus 4 plus 64 over t plus 4. Okay. Okay, now we answer the question. This is the, the uh, difficult part has been done. One, we had two parts to this question. One, way up there. Determine the amount of salt in the tank after 20 minutes, and then the concentration at that time. The amount of salt at that time, at 20 minutes, is simply S of 20. 
S of 20, if you substitute T equals 20, you're going to get, I got this and I used my calculator to compute this, about 98.7 grams. Two was asking for the concentration in the tank at time T. So that would be the concentration leaving at 20. That would be S of 20 over V of 20. Okay, and that would be, uh, it turns out to be 2.06 grams per liter. Okay, remember the volume the volume was 2t plus 8, and that's all I did is I substitute 20 into there into that. Okay. So it should be about 2.06 grams per liter. Alright. We have one more application to look at for this for this section. Okay, and I think the homework that I assigned concentrates on these on these two application problems. So let's take a look at one more example, real popular example. So this last application has to do with a very, very important uh, law from physics called Newton's Law of Cooling or Warming. I'll explain. I'll explain. The uh, Newton's Law of Cooling or war Warming has to do with uh, the temperature of an object that's placed inside of a medium. Medium meaning uh an oven take an object cookies put into an oven or a refrigerator let's say fridge or uh, a room inside of a room that's held at a particular constant temperature or outside in open air open air okay the object can be anything. It can, it can be, what are you going to put in a, an oven? A cookie? If you put an object, in the, a cookie in an oven, the cookie is going to warm up and cook. <laughs> the the, the uh, cookie will warm. So the, the Newton's Law of Cooling is a way of estimating the temperature of the cookie as time t. Uh, what are you going to put in the fridge? I don't know, a grape? <laughs> so in the grape, if you put it in the fridge, the grape was at room temperature before, the, the grape will cool. Uh, open air or a room? Well, we're going to get a little drastic here. Let's say a dead body. <laughs> a dead body. And I'm bringing this, the idea of a dead body up uh, to illustrate that this Newton's Law of Cooling can be used to uh, solve problems in forensic science. Forensic science. In forensic science, if you if for, for specifically, if you find that somebody died in a room, you're interested in their time of death. Okay. Well, the if you place a body, uh, a, a, a dead body in a room, its initial temperature was about 98.6. If it was a healthy human. And the room was probably held at a temperature lower than that, so the, the body will cool, and Newton's Law of Cooling estimates the temperature at time t. And you're interested in the time of death, so we, we know that the time of death uh, is whenever the temperature of the body was 98.6. So much more of that coming, coming up uh, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Well, what does Newton's Law of Cooling say? Newton's Law of Cooling says that the rate of change, the rate of change of temperature, temperature of an object, of an object, is proportional to, is proportional to, the difference between the difference between the temperature of the object see the, the rate of change of temperature of an object is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object 
structure of the object and the temperature of the surrounding medium. Temperature of the surrounding medium. Now let's put a an equation to this. Okay, so let's let T, capital T of small t equal the temperature of the object that's placed in the oven or room or fridge or whatever, the temperature of the object at time t. Let's let T sub M equal the temperature of the medium. And let's say for our, pro for our purposes that it's constant. Okay, let's say constant. Constant. Okay, so let's set up Newton's law of cooling. Newton's law of cooling says the rate of change of the temperature, that's dt, d capital T, d, d time, is proportional to, so equals some constant, I'll explain the negative in a second, is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object, T, and the surrounding medium. The, the negative here is traditional. It doesn't have to be in the problem. The negative here is traditional. Uh, since it's called Newton's law of cooling, that sort of implies that the derivative is negative, so the temperature decreased. But this also works for warming. Uh, and again, the, 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 the idea of having negative k instead of positive k is purely traditional. In fact, your, your tech, the author of your textbook doesn't have negative, negative k. Your, the, the author of your textbook uses a different variable. I don't like his choice of a variable. You can use it if you want. He uses uh, theta for temperature. I've never seen that before, but that's okay. It doesn't mean anything. It just means I've never seen it before. He says d theta dt equals k times theta m minus theta. Okay, it's the same thing. You factor out a negative uh, from theta m minus theta, you get the the negative constant. Okay, it's the same. It's the same thing. But I use capital T. And I factor out the minus, okay? Okay. So, um, so what, what do we expect the solution to this differential equation to look like? What do we expect the solution to look like? Here's T, time. Here's temperature, T. Okay. And here's the temperature of the surrounding medium. The temperature inside the oven, the temperature in open air, the temperature in a room in an apartment, the temperature inside the oven, constant. Well, let's say it's the temperature of an oven. Okay, and let's say that you initially place the cookie in the oven with a temperature of T naught or T sub zero. The cookie, when you put it in the oven, is not going to be as hot as the inside of the oven. It's going to be about room temperature, 70 degrees or Fahrenheit, and the temperature of the oven might be 300, 350. And as soon as you, you, you uh, put the cookie into the oven, the cookie will warm. Newton's law of cooling predicts that the, the cookie will warm exponentially in, in, uh, uh, to, to the temperature of the uh, in, with some exponential function, using one, some exponential function, until it approaches the temperature of the oven. On the other hand, if you take a dead body and place it in the room, it'll have a particular temperature that will probably be more than the room. And as soon as the body ceases to function, it will cool. And the temperature of the body will approach the temperature of the room. So this would be an, a, a media example of the body versus the cookie. You can have both of these things going on simultaneously, although T sub M will be different. For, obviously, you're not going to put a body into an oven. That's pretty gross. 
<laughs> okay, I want to solve one problem, one application problem that didn't solve cooling, and then we'll call it quits for this video segment. So here's our last problem. A dead body is discovered in an apartment. The body, the temperature of the body is found to be 92 degrees. So the body has a temperature of 92 degrees when, when found. The temperature of the body was recorded an hour later and one hour after it was discovered, the temperature was then again taken of the body. It seems kind of weird to take the temperature of a dead body an hour again afterwards, but you'll see why we needed to do that. And the temperatures decreased to 87 degrees. It should decrease. If the temperature of the apartment is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, so the temperature of the, the apartment is held at a nice constant temperature, of, uh, a constant of the temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit, estimate the time of death. Okay, so let's um let's analyze the the, the data that are given. The initial temperature T sub zero of the body is 92 degrees. Okay, one hour later, so T of 1, the temperature of the body decreased to 87 degrees. And we're asked to find, let's say, time sub death. Find the time of death. So what's going on graphically is this. Here's, here's what's going on graphically. The, here's the the y-axis or the vertical axis is represents temperature horizontal axis represents time and the, this dotted line represents the temperature of the apartment okay so Newton's law of cooling says that uh, as soon as the temp the body was found and it was found to have a temperature of 92, let's put that here, 92 degrees, the temperature will decrease using an exponential function. We're interested in the time of death. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow time to be negative and assume then that, that this trend would continue into ne the, the realm of negative values for time. We're interested in, and this is not going to be the scale, to scale, the time in which the body was about 98.6 degrees, 98.6. This is the temperature of a healthy living human, <laughs> living person. And the time of death then would be that negative value of time that corresponds to the temperature being 98.6. So what we're, doing, we're going to do is this. We're going to find the temperature as a function of time. Then we're going to set the temperature equal to 98.6 and solve for the time of death. Okay. Okay, so let's begin. Newton's law of cooling says that the rate of change of the temperature is directly proportional, so minus K times, directly proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object, T, and the temperature of the surrounding me re medium. The room is held fixed at 72 degrees. Okay, and we have two conditions on the temperature. This is not an initial value problem, by the way. This is not an initial value problem. An initial value problem has a differential equation and one initial condition. This kind of problem is called a boundary value problem. This is called a boundary value problem. Boundary value problem. They are much more difficult to solve. 
balance than the initial value problem. The boundary value problem has differential equation and uh, boundary conditions, a condition at t equals zero and a, and a condition at some other point t equals one, okay, in this case. Okay, uh, it's not essentially the, essential that you memorize what a boundary value problem is. It's just step one or two. Uh, differentiate, no pun intended, between boundary value problems and initial value problems. Okay, let's solve this boundary value problem. Let's uh, let's solve this this differential equation. It's first order linear, but it's also separable. So I'm going to separate the variables. So let's say dt over t minus 72 equals negative k d time. Integrate both sides. So the natural log of the absolute value of t minus 72 equals negative kt plus say c1 a constant e to both sides so let's exponentiate so t my absolute value t minus 72 equals e to the same old stuff we've, we've, we've done before e to the e to the c1 e to the negative kt so t minus 72 equals um, another constant, let's say c, e to the minus kt, where c equals plus or minus e to the c1. Okay, so the temperature is 72 plus c, e to the negative kt. And now, you, now we get a reason why we needed to take the temperature of the body an hour later. The problem couldn't be solved uh, by just using an initial condition, because there are two there are two constants involved in this different the solution to this differential equation. One is the constant of proportionality, that negative k, and the other is the c, the constant that are, that uh, arises from solving the differential equation. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the initial condition. So t of zero equals ninety two. That implies that 92 should equal 72 plus C. That means my constant, uh, my constant C should equal 20. So that tells me at this, at this time I know that T then equals 72 plus 20 e to the negative KT. Now apply the, the second initial condition. <coughs> Or the, no, I'm sorry, the second condition, T of one hour later is 87. So 87 equals 72 plus, a little more complicated, 20 e to the negative k. Okay, so uh, continuing on, 15 equals 20 e to the negative k. So e to the negative k equals 15 over 20, which is 3 fourths. So taking natural logs, k equals minus the natural log of 3 fourths. Okay, and that value, do we need it? Yeah, we kind of need it. So this is approximately point 29. It's a positive value. The log of 3 fourths is negative, and the negative in front makes it positive. So k is a positive constant. Okay. So um, the time of death. The temperature then equals 72 plus 20 e to the point, negative point 29t. So to find the time of death, we're going to substitute healthy temperature, 98.6 equals 72 plus 20 e to the negative 0.29 times time sub death, and solve for the time of death. Okay, so if we subtract 72 from both sides, we get 26.6 equals 20 e to the negative point 29 times of death. So if we divide by 20, we get about 1.33 equals e to the 
minus 0.29. I would not round off that k till the end. I would use the whole value. I'm just putting in negative point or 0.29 for for ease of looking at this. So if we if we uh, take natural logs and then divide by negative 0.29, we get the time of death then is equal to let's say negative one, approximately a negative one over 0.29. Again, I use the whole decimal for k in my answer. Uh, natural log of uh, 1.33, and that's approximately negative 0.991 hours. And if you multiply that by 60, because there, uh, there are 60 minutes per hour, this is approximately 59.5. Minutes ago. So negative 59.5 or 59 minutes 30 seconds ago. Okay, this is this is real world mathematics. Just to, to end the to end this problem on a on a more important on a real important note here, the conditions were optimum here. The room was held fixed at 32. Rooms don't always have a fixed uh, temperature of 72 degrees. So that, that we're, there's, a, there's a major estimation there or major um, potential for error there. Um, also, um, other, other methods are used to, to verify times the time of death for this one it probably wouldn't work too well but very often and it, I, I get my my information off of the internet that I'm not a forensic scientist but other other pieces of information might be used such as uh, as soon as a as soon as a person dies uh, and apparently this happens very quickly flies flies enter the body and lay eggs and the forensic scientists are familiar with the life cycle of maggots of, of, of fly babies. So if we observe uh, fly maggots on the uh, dead body and, and, and observe at what point in their life cycle they are, that you can estimate or verify the time of death by estimate the, estimating the time of uh, birth, I guess, <laughs> for, the, for the maggots. So anyways, this just to, just to keep it real. And with that kind of bizarre end here to our to this to this uh, uh, specific problem, I'm going to end the lecture for this section for this for this uh, video segment. So feel free to get started on homework as soon as possible. And as usual, I am looking forward to talking with you all again very very soon.